Well, I am, I am so honored. I mean, I really mean this. I told Jeremiah a while ago, I am honored that I am able to be here to hear his first sermon. Amen? I mean, that's just a blessing. And so, um, <clears throat> you ready? Here. All right, buddy, go get them. <laughs> Right. Thank you so much, Pastor Jerry, for have inviting me to come preach this morning. It's not this morning, but <laughs> it's such an honor to have this opportunity. And thank you to all of you for coming to listen. I mean, I don't know if I have much for you, but hopefully the, you can get something out of the word. But um, Mims has been such a blessing over the past few years since I've been here. But I know it's connected to my family for decades. And uh, it's just, I can't think of a better place to have the opportunity to teach for the first time. And uh, let me give you a little, little background on me. So I was, I came to know the Lord from a very young age, but throughout, so throughout high school, I thought what I wanted to do was to be a doctor. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I was, my whole high school was geared towards, you know, <laughs> this wasn't exactly my first choice. Right, so that's what I was hoping for. And then last year, well, I'm still in high school, so it's last school year, right? Um, my prayer was that God would show me what he has for my life. And uh, in January, I, was, I felt called to the ministry, but <laughs> it wasn't until uh, this summer between camps and uh, mission trip that I felt called to pastor and preach. So, <laughs> thank you. But uh, so, after I felt called, I decided this year would be about preparation. And uh, speaking of preparation, that's what we're going to be talking about today. If you'll open your Bibles to Acts, it will be in Acts chapter 1. So, Luke wrote the book of Acts as very much a continuation of the book of the Gospel of Luke, right? So, they're two different books, but it's very much one story. It, it, it's very, so we see here in Acts chapter one, verse number one, we see the first two verses really recapping a little bit of the book of Luke. So in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Right, so we see in my former book, he's referring to the book of Luke. Uh, he's addressing it to Theophilus. So the book of Acts is addressed as well as the book of Luke. They're both addressed to Theophilus, but they're really intended for all believers. Because the book of Acts, it really gives a history of the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem all the, all the way through to Rome, which is quite important because if we read through the gospels and then the next book was Romans, you'd have no clue how the spread of the gospel was going and the, how we got the Holy Spirit and things like that. So we see um, really in verse number three is where we get to get into what we have in Acts. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. All right. So he starts it out with after his suffering... I think it's interesting. He doesn't depict Jesus, as, he doesn't say after his glorious resurrection or anything like that. He depicts him as the suffering servant. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. 40 days, another interesting thing. We see the number 40 used in the Bible 159 times. Uh, the Israelites were wandering in the desert for 40 years. Um, God had the earth as a flood for 40 years. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus all fasted for 40 days. Uh, even Goliath taunted the Israelites for 40 days. So we see it used as a, um, it represents a time of testing and preparation in the Bible. So we see here they're with him for 40 days and he's really testing and preparing the disciples to continue the ministry without, without in his absence. So we see um, and immediately, as soon as Jesus ascends, um, immediately the disciples are preparing for his return, right? And Jesus hasn't returned yet, so we need to be preparing for his return as well. 
All right. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. All right. So as we're preparing for his return, there really we see here the first step is over these 40 days, the disciples were really getting to know Jesus and his intentions for them in his absence. So the first thing we need to do is we need to get to know him to be prepared for his return. First, to know him as our savior, right? Because there's no, there's nothing, there's no benefit for a unbeliever in Christ's return, right? There's nothing, there's no appeal in that. So first we need to know him as our savior, right? One easy way to know in your heart if he's your savior is if he returned, if it was right now that he returned, would he be collecting you to go with him, right? So we need to know him in order for, to be prepared for our Savior. But we also need to know him in order to receive his gift of the Holy Spirit, right? We see him talk about John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Um, all right. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father's promise, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So we need to know him in order to receive his gift of the Holy Spirit. And we need the gift of the Holy Spirit in order to go and to minister and prepare others for his return. So we see here that they had to wait in Jerusalem. This is the only thing Jesus told them to do, right? This is the only thing on the checklist was to go and wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit. We see earlier in verse number two, um, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, right? So even Jesus needed the Holy Spirit. If if he needed it, I mean, certainly we do. And this is a a good illustration of, um, I mean, sometimes, I mean, if you were with Jesus and he was preparing you for his absence for 40 days, I'd be pretty keyed up too and ready to go. But he's telling them, no, you need to wait, you need to wait. Right? There's some times that we are excited to go do things for the Lord, but it may not be what he has intended for us to do. Right? I could go be a missionary to Africa, but if that's not what the Lord has me to do, then it's of no benefit to the kingdom. Right? So uh, we need to, to know the Lord in order to prepare for his return, but we also need to prepare others for his return. Um, all right, <laughs> and we see in verse number six. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Right, so he just told them they're gonna get the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they immediately ask, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And um, the reason why they asked is because we see in Ezekiel and Isaiah, there are some, uh, some prophecy that connects the coming of the Spirit and Christ's return. So, but they ask this question, their question, it really reveals the disciples' political desires at the time, because um, throughout Jesus' ministry, they really wanted him to declare himself the Messiah and start a rebellion and overthrow, you know, the iron hand of the Roman Empire or whatever. So this is what they desired. So as soon as they heard the, uh, him tell them, hey, the, uh, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit, they were immediately like, oh, it's time for us to go, right? They were all <laughs> excited about that. But it's not, he says to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, right? So he, he didn't deny the coming of the kingdom at all, but he just warned the disciples that the timing was uh, none of their business. Right? So, <laughs> but, um, but the disciples all believed, uh, they knew Christ was going to, well, I don't know if they did know this, but he was going to uh, ascend pretty soon. But they all believed that he would return in their time and establish his kingdom, right? That's why you don't see the uh, gospels written until decades later as they all thought he was gonna return quite soon. And uh, it was just told to realize, hey, this may not be in my lifetime that they decided to, it was important to document what had happened. Right, so in verse number seven, he says, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Right, so now we get to see 
he's telling them, hey, it's time, not only do you need to know the Lord to prepare yourself, you also need to go and prepare others for his return. Because like we said earlier, there's, there's nothing good for an unbeliever with Christ's return. Right, so he uses Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth really as a way to say, hey, you know, this, it, this gospel isn't just for you, right? You have to go and tell everybody the ends of the earth. And one way we can apply this is go and tell everyone in Conroe and Montgomery County and Texas and to the end of the earth, right? So he's painting a picture for all of us. It's not just a, it's not a, a, a selective gospel, right? After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking up intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has taken you, has been taken from you into heaven will come back the same way you have seen him going to heaven. Right, so we see he tells them to go and you know, prepare, prepare other people to, uh, for his return. And he ascends into heaven and all the disciples are standing there. They're waiting. And, uh, I guess he'll be back in a couple weeks or so, right? I guess <laughs> joke's on them, right? So, but I mean, we do, the, I know of some people and I do the same thing sometimes saying, hey, when's Christ going to return? You know, eschatology is very interesting. That's the study of end times, but it's very interesting because we all want to know what happens in the future, right? But we can't let that uh, hinder our obedience to what he's told us to do, which is to go and make disciples of all nations. And uh, that's pretty much all I got for you, so. I can't tell you how many times I want to close like that. Amen. That's, that's, uh, that's about all I got for you. Amen. Jeremiah, uh, I, I want to be very careful with what I'm about to say because uh, you need to follow the path the Lord has for you. You need to always obey the Lord, and you need to allow the Lord to always lead you and mold you into what He wants you to be. And I'm not a prophet, and I'm not the son of a prophet. And... Uh, but as I was sitting there, I just felt like the Lord put on my heart that there will be a day, and, and I need you to hear this, where pastors will listen to you teach. And I don't really know what that means, and I hope that doesn't disturb you, because this is your race. It's not mine. It's not anyone else's. It's yours. But I really believe the Lord has given you an incredible mind and an incredible gift that if you'll just continue to give it to him and let him lead you. And I, and I shudder to say this, but my wife said the other day that the Lord will use you similarly to David Allen in a way to really lead and mold and shape people in their futures. And I believe that with every fiber of my being. What a heart, because you could be a doctor. And there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. No doubt in my mind. In fact, they'd probably just pass you right through medical school. <laughs> I mean, amen? But just your heart that says, Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. We commend you. And, and we love you. And we thank the Lord for you. And, and there's so much negative. But we as a church want to encourage you and, and pour gasoline on your fire to just be what the Lord wants you to be and just to keep following him. And, and you don't have all of the answers now, and I hope this encourages you. I don't mean this to discourage you. I'm 50, and I still don't have all the answers. But you just keep one step at a time obeying the Lord, surrendering to the Lord. And what you've done tonight is a witness to all of us, 17 years old, and how you were willing to just come up here and share what a testimony 
And I want to encourage you. And I'm sorry for just singling you out and just continuing to talk like you're the only one in the room, even though everyone else is listening. But we, we as a church have prayed that God would raise up young men to preach. And we believe you're an answer to prayer. And we don't believe you're the only answer to prayer. We believe there are others. And Larry and Colleen, your kids are your report card, and you get an A++. And we're so thankful. Amen? So, I don't know what that means. You don't, don't let that control you. You do what the Lord wants you to do. He'll take you where he wants you. He'll put you where he wants you. And people will always try to live your life for you. Always. No matter how old you get, they'll always. You just be what the Lord wants you to be. But the brilliant mind that he's given you is a gift from him. And the thing about you that's so refreshing is there's no pride in that. You just acknowledge the Lord's given you that. And I thank you for your heart and for what you've shared. What an encouragement. Amen? I mean, what a blessing. So, And... <laughs> You went longer than eight minutes, amen? <laughs> God's good, amen? What a blessing, what an encouragement. And so, you know what? Look, uh, you will always be able to say that you were here when Jeremiah preached his first sermon. And some of you are going to say, God, please let our pastor start preaching <laughs> like that. And uh, there's no danger of that, I promise. So, uh, Jeremiah... Would I embarrass you if I asked you to come up here and we as a church just gathered around you and prayed for you? You and your parents come. Would you mind? Come on and stand up here. and uh, We're going to just come gather around you and pray for you as a church because we're so honored and privileged just to be a part of this. And What a blessing. You said it earlier that your family has such a legacy here, grandma and grandpa, and what a blessing that they are in all of the years and the generations. Church, y'all just come gather around. Just begin praying over this young man, if you would, and thank the Lord for him and for his heart tonight just to share with us. And Lord, I thank you for Jeremiah. What a blessing. What a privilege for us to be together tonight in your presence and for you to use him to speak to our heart and to challenge us. Lord, we want to know you to be prepared for your spirit and then we want to go get others prepared to know you and for your return. And Lord, I just thank you for Jeremiah's heart to just say, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Help us as a church never to do anything, ever, to discourage, to distract, but to only encourage. We together in Jesus' name, thank you for him. And pray for your glory and honor that your good hand would continue to rest on him. Make the way for him, Lord. I pray for his senior year, that it be his best year. I pray your favor rest upon him. I pray you'd use him to stir a revival in his school. Thank you for his dad and mom and siblings and grandparents, his family. Bless them. Thank you for their heart. And tonight, our hearts are just overjoyed that you're working in his life. And I pray that, Lord, you'll make the way clear to him every step of the way. Thank you, Lord, tonight for his unwavering conviction of your word. Lord, he started by saying, I don't know that I have anything to say to you, but maybe you'll get blessed by something from the word. Thank you for a young man that acknowledges the authority is your word. Bless him, anoint him, provide for him, minister to him. Thank you for him. We just, Lord, we just feel, I just feel honored to be here tonight and to sit at his feet and to listen to you use him. Thank you for that privilege and that honor. We love you, Lord. And as a church, we just acknowledge your blessing, your goodness, your great hand. Thank you for Jeremiah. Satan, we command you to be gone. We take authority over you. You have no right to Jeremiah. And we pray, Heavenly Father, a hedge of protection about him all the days of his life. Guard his mind. Guard his heart. Just continue to keep him ever so close to you. 
Thank you for this special young man and how you're just singling him out and using him for your glory. We love you and we bless you and we praise you and we thank you for all that you're going to continue to do in his life. In Jesus' name, amen.